Regina Chaley, Queen of Heaven, rejoice, alleluia, for he whom you did merit to bear, alleluia, has risen as he said, alleluia. Pray for us to God, alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary, alleluia, for the Lord has truly risen, alleluia. Let us pray, O God, who gave joy to the whole world through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant me beseech thee, that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, we may obtain the joys of everlasting life through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brethren, today we gather to celebrate this holy sacrifice of the Mass on this very special Sunday as we celebrate the fifth Sunday of the season of Easter. We also celebrate Mother's Day today, and I really hope that everyone had a blessed Mother's Day to the best of our ability. I know it's a very sad Mother's Day today because we're unable to see our moms, most of us, as I was unable to see mine who's in Smithfield, Rhode Island, uh, but we're praying for them and, and uh, we do have FaceTime and this technology that at least we can see them or talk to them. So we ask God to bless them today. Brethren, in this mass, we pause to examine our consciences as we do in this rite of penance, to examine, to ask God's forgiveness for our sins in the times that we have failed. Him. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O oh God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, constantly accomplish the Paschal mystery within us, that those you were pleased to make new in holy baptism may under your protective care bear much fruit and come to the joys of eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. As the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the 12 called together the community of the disciples and said, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at tables. Brothers, select from among you seven reputable men filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we shall appoint to this task, whereas we shall devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The proposal was accepted to the whole community. So they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procarius, Niconio, Timon, and Perimenes. Perimenes, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Our responsorial psalm, Lord, let your people, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. Lord, let your mercy be upon us as we place our trust in you. Exalt you just in the Lord. Praise from the upright is fitting. Give thanks to the Lord on the harp with the ten string lyre, chant his praises. Lord, let your mercy be upon us as we place our trust in you. Upright is the word of the Lord, and all his works are trustworthy. He loves justice and right. Of the kindness of the Lord, the earth is full. Lord, let your mercy be upon us as we place our trust in you. See the eyes of the Lord are upon those who fear him, upon those who hope in his kindness to deliver them from death and preserve them in spirit of famine, in spite of famine. Lord, let your mercy be upon us as we place our trust in you. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, come to him, a living stone rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be, hope, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in scripture, behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, a chosen, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in it shall be put to shame. And whoever believes in it shall not be put to shame. Therefore, its value is for all who have faith. But for those without faith, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that will make people stumble and a rock that will make people fall. They stumble by disobeying the word as it is their destiny. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may announce the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father except through me. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith in me also. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If not, if they were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Tom, Philip? Whomever the Father, whom, whoever has seen the Father has seen the Son. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we find ourselves in the situation that we're in, which is very, very difficult and stressful and certainly problematic. And in the midst of this, we find ourselves with this great gospel passage to really help us in our pilgrim journey to understand the Lord's compassion and mercy and greatness that in the midst of this, what happens to be the gospel passage for this weekend, as now especially we're feeling more and more angst because we really are itching to get back to normalcy or some kind of normalcy, certainly to get back into church. And we're anxious and we're worried. And in the midst of this, and it was actually the reading during this week, Jesus says to us these great words, do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, it's interesting because I was thinking about the time last year when I went to Italy with a priest friend, uh, Father Bankford. And Father Bankford's half Italian. His mother comes from two little towns that are her origins from Forgia. So, um, you know, near um, Bari and, and that area. So we knew the towns and the names of the towns. So we wanted to, you know, look them up and we wanted to go there. Now, I've driven many, many times in Italy. I've rented cars and I've been to many different places all through Italy. Not so much the north as much, but, but certainly the central part and the south. So I'm very familiar with the road system and how it works. It's very, it's very difficult in Italy to drive. I, I really don't recommend that you, if you haven't been to, to, to driven in Italy, um, that you rent a car and kind of you know go all, all over it. It's a little difficult because they do have something which is similar to our road system, our highway system, which is called an autostrata. And the autostrata is, is kind of like our highways. It's open, there are several lanes, you know, it's, it, there are exits that are very well marked. It's a you know, well-paved uh, highway. So you would feel comfortable on those roads if you're an American and you're renting a car in Italy and haven't driven before there. But to get to, you know, point A to point B, only a portion of the the um, of of the trip and the journey, a small portion actually, is going to be on an autostrada. Mostly, you have to go through the small towns, and especially too, you have to go up and back down pretty high hills and mountains. And so, in Italy, it's very 
difficult and somewhat perilous even because, you know, you're traveling on this mountain, going up the, the mountain in a circular fashion. So you're constantly making turns if you're going up or if you're coming back down. Because usually a lot of these towns are built on the top of the hills. So as you're going, you find that there's a pretty steep drop, of course, because you're going up a, a mountain or a hill. It's a pretty steep drop. And then the road is kind of narrow and it's a two lane road of, of cars going on either side of the road. So the thing is that you're driving on a narrow road with a pretty steep um, uh, drop and, and you can't see what's around the corner typically. Because, because you're going in a circular fashion, you're constantly making turns where you can't see what's around the corner in a very narrow road. So a lot of times you could be turning the corner and a big truck or another car that's going fast will be coming up upon you as you're making the turn and it surprises you because you don't know if he's there. And there's enough room for both, but you really have to stay in your lane. You really do. And uh, you can't veer off your lane when you're in that kind of a straight road with traffic going both ways and you can't see what's coming around the corner. So as a result, Father Benford was like, I, you know, oh, you know, I, you know, getting all nervous. And I'm like, Ron, don't worry about it. Relax. You know, I, I got this. You know, I, I've been traveling these mountains and hills, you know, for 20 years renting cars. I go to Italy all the time. I'm very familiar with it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I know, but, oh, you know, but, but these cars, they go so fast and, you know, we're on such a narrow road and it's such a big drop. And you know something, I, I can't blame him in a sense because he's in the passenger seat. He doesn't have control of the car and he's with another person who's fallible, right? I'm only human. I can make mistakes. I can make errors. You know, so I can understand the angst that someone would feel traveling, never been to Italy for the most part, at least in a rented car, going into small towns and small little hamlets and paes, you know, these little towns of paes where, they, where they're built on mountains. And, and, and so it, it's somewhat perilous. But think about this. Think about that you're on these roads that I'm describing. And you're the passenger and Jesus is driving. <laughs> Jesus is in the driver's seat. Are you going to be scared or worried? <laughs> Absolutely not. If Father Capriani is in the driver's seat, well, you know, you know, you know, you, you, you know I'm not going to hurt you, and I'm certainly don't want to hurt myself, but I'm only human, I'm fallible, and the other guy that's coming is is the only human too. So you know, you, you never know. I mean, I, I, to be honest, right? But when it's Jesus though in the, in the driver's seat, would you be afraid? You would even maybe fall asleep. You would feel comfortable enough to fall asleep if he's in the driver's seat, because you know that nothing bad is going to happen to you. And even if something bad happens, like an accident, you're with Jesus. He can take care of any problem that you have when you're in the passenger seat. And that's what we have to do. We have to put Jesus in the driver's seat, especially in a perilous situation where we don't know what's around the corner. None of us knows what's around the corner. We've never experienced anything like this before with a whole... Uh, the whole economy shut down and everything just in one day closed. Even in 1918, in that pandemic, millions of people died, but they didn't because they didn't close anything down. The economy just kept going and people were dying, and, but the economy just keep, kept going. People still lived their, their lives the way they were used to living them and just really having to deal with the, the horrific tragedy of so many people dying. So to save lives in this pandemic, we're in self-quarantine and we're sheltered in to protect our other people and also ourselves. And it's scary. And we don't know what's coming around. We're driving on a hill going up a mountain where we can't, on a narrow road with traffic coming in the other direction where we can't see what's around the corner. But if Jesus is in the driver's seat, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing. And, and, and this is what Jesus is saying to us in this gospel. Hey, guys, I'm in the driver's seat. Don't worry. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith in me. 
And, and, and this, these are the consoling words that he gives us and helps us to really understand who he is, why we should have faith in him and why we shouldn't be afraid and let our hearts be troubled. Why? Because he's not just a prophet like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah. He's not even like a great saint like John the Baptist. He's not even a great figure in the Old Testament like Moses, the, probably the greatest figure in the Old Testament. He's none of them. He's God himself. And that's why he tells Philip, when Philip says, you know, if we could see the Father, that would be good enough for us. And Jesus kind of, I bet he was kind of chuckling a little when he said this to Philip, like, and like maybe, you know, put his head, put his hand, his palm of his hand on his forehead. Like, Philip, Philip. Hey, you know, don't you know me by now? Do you see all the works? Jesus said, look at the works. Do you see all the works that I'm doing? Come on, you've been around me long enough to know that the Father and I are one. He says to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We're one. And so Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. He is God himself made flesh and dwelling among us. The second person of the Holy Trinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And with him in charge, there's nothing that we need to worry about. And that's why when it's time for us to get back out there in the world, hopefully I'm praying that we've learned some lessons during this time. We've learned the importance of family. We've learned the importance of God, most especially, of, of wanting to see the mass streamed online. Can't wait for us to get back into church. I'm wondering, when the church opens and things start to get, hopefully, to somewhat normalcy, I'm wondering if masses are gonna be as filled every week as they are at Easter and Christmas. It may, as long as we don't let us get distracted. Before this pandemic happened and we've been sheltered in the houses, we have been so distracted on Sunday morning. Everything, it seems, came before going to mass. Driving our kids to hockey, to basketball, to soccer, to dance, to karate. And you know, these guys who run these programs, they don't care. They're like, the only time we can get the gym is Sunday. That's when we're gonna do it. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, or Sunday morning at nine o'clock. And then Catholics would try to sign up for these courses and they conflict with confirmation classes or catechism classes. And then, you know, if the parents give the kids the, op the option, well, what would you rather do, go to mass or, or be in this basketball league? Now, you give a kid that kind of an option, most of them are probably going to pick the basketball. That's where the parents have to say, look, yeah, you're going to be disappointed because we can't join this league. It happens when you have catechism classes. It happens when you have confirmation classes. You can't be dribbling a basketball on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You know, I was at uh, teaching at CJCR and because uh, I was at St. Mark's for two years in Garden City in Cranston. And I was teaching religion, and it was Monday morning, and I said to the kids, how many of you, I think middle school kids, and I said, how many of you went to Mass this weekend? Just wanted to know. Mm, less than half raised their hands. So I said, well, does someone want to volunteer? Just out of curiosity, why didn't you get to Mass this weekend? And one kid raised his hand and said, I had hockey, you know, hockey practice at 9 o'clock, and just we had to get to the rink early. By the time we had the practice and leave, you know, that it was the whole morning. So I said to him, well, you're going to tell your coach that you have to go to Mass, that he has to schedule these things at another time. And the kid said to me, very honestly, it was incredible. The kid said to me, we did. My parents and, and I said, you know, we go to Mass on Sunday morning and, you know, the priest wants us to go to catechism classes and that's the time we do things. And the coach said, tell the priest that I'm more important than him. That's what the coach, the hockey coach, told the kid to tell me. The hockey coach is more important than mass than me on Sunday, than coming to mass, than listening to the priest who's telling him to come to mass. 
the hockey coach is more important to say, come to hockey practice. In eternal life, is Jesus going to judge us on how good of a hockey player we are? On if we went to practice every time when we were supposed to on Sunday morning or mass? And see, this is where the reset line. This is, this is an opportunity for families to hit the reset line, to realize, wow, we're sheltered together. You know, we're, we're spending a lot of time together. We're praying more because we're so anxious and we're turning to God. And, and, and we're, we're as a family eating together and, and praying together and going to school together in the same house. And, it, and, and it's hopefully this will set the reset button for our priorities to realize mass is the most important thing on Sunday morning. That God, family, and friends, neighborhood, community, country, this is what's important. My sister and I, my middle sister Anne Marie and I were just on the phone before mass and we were talking about you know, how much we miss seeing everybody and, you know, and it's so difficult and we can't see our mother today and it was so hard. And we were saying, you know, I can't wait for us to get together. And we got to call our cousins and we got to, you know, we have to, you know, and I said, you're right. I said, I know. I said, we got to, we got to have a big party this summer where all our cousins are there because we're talking to them online or seeing them through FaceTime, but we're talking to them on the phone, but obviously it's not the same thing. You know, so I think what we're feeling in my family that we want to organize to get all our, and our second cousins, we have, I have so many second cousins that I haven't seen in so long. And my, my sister was saying that, that my second cousins would love to get together with my niece and, you know, who would be their, you know, cousins through the next generation because they are so similar. And, you know, they, you know, in the way they have kids and they have, you know, families and they're working and they're doing some great things. And, and they naturally would get along so well if they just got to know each other a little better. But over the generations, you know, we kind of, you know, don't see each other as much as we should. Although I'm close to my, still my first cousins. Um, but, you know, this is what we're talking about nowadays. Isn't that great that this is what we're talking about? You know, this is the important things. God, family, friends, this is what's important. And this is what we're, I think what we're realizing and we're valuing. And I don't think, hopefully, when we get out of this, I don't think a, a parent is going to take that when a coach says that he's more important than the priest. You've got to listen to him more than the priest. After we get done with this, I don't think a parent is going to, is going to put up with that and say, sorry, my son's not playing hockey. He's going to have his, his body in, in mass and receive the Eucharist. You know, it's more important than chasing a hockey puck. Sorry, nothing, nothing personal against that sport. Um, that's where our priorities are and need to be. And, and it's because we're realizing now that we have to turn to God. We're forced to, in a sense, because we can't let our hearts be troubled. We can't do this alone. We'll go crazy. We'll go crazy if we try and do this alone. It'll, it'll keep us up every night if we try to worry about every single problem we have because of this pandemic. And that's what Jesus is saying, look, I'm in the driver's seat in a perilous road. Don't worry. The roads may be narrow or they may be perilous. They may have a long drop to them. But don't worry. I am here with you in the driver's seat. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God is our Father. We turn to him with all our needs and concerns for the Pope, bishops, and all leaders of the church. May God bestow his wisdom upon them as they lead the church in times of sadness and crisis. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all mothers on Mother's Day, we thank God for the gift of life and childbearing. May they be honored today by the sacrifices they made and the love that they give to their children throughout their lives, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all pregnant women who are celebrating being a mother for the first time this Mother's Day, may they stay healthy and safe as they prepare for the baby's birth, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to the coronavirus, may Americans emerge from this pandemic stronger than ever and have a greater awareness of the importance of God and family being at the forefront of our lives, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the, pre for the three priests for whom we pray at this Mass and will be praying for this week, Father Dennis Keaton, Father Jacques Eddy Cavanus, and Father Peter D'Ambrosia. May God help them in their duties and may they persevere in their priesthood. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for, those, <clears throat> for those who have died this week, Dennis Savigny, for Santa Rizzuto, Giuseppe Caracciolo, Maria Giorno, and especially we pray for Kathy DeBella, Helen Cretella, Louis Maar, and Terry Mag Magian, for whom we pray at this Holy Mass in a special way. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the intentions we hold that remain in the quietness of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God of love and mercy, we thank you for the gift of faith. Listen to the petitions we present to you for those in need, and grant our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread, this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. 
O God, who by the wonderful exchange effected in this sacrifice have made us partakers of the one supreme Godhead, grant, we pray, that as we have come to know your truth, we may make it ours by a worthy way of life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time, above all, to loud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. By the oblation of his body, he brought the sacrifices of old to fulfillment in the reality of the cross, and by commending himself to you for our salvation, showed himself the priest, the altar, and the lamb of sacrifice. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every man, every people exalts in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deo, Sabato, plenisum celia terra, gloria tua, hosanna in excelsis, benedictus, qui veni et nomine domini, hosanna in excelsis. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis our Pope, Thomas our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For then we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all the saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from final damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up. For you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the, this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands 
And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fadei, Morte Tua, Annunciamos Domine, Et Tuam Resurrectionem Confitemur, Domine Venias. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your majesty and your glory from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly confidence and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. We pray especially this evening for Kathy DeBella, Helen Cretella, Louis, I'm sorry, Lois Marr, and Terry Magdian. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all the saints, admit us, we beseech you into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through him you continue to give all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, you make them holy, you bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours 
now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not upon our sins, but upon the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you all. On you stay, we call his peccatamundi, misere nobis. On you stay, we call his peccatamundi, misere Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. <clears throat> Let us pray. Graciously be present to your people, we pray, O Lord, and lead those you have imbued with heavenly mysteries to pass from former ways to newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just have a couple of announcements. I want to first uh, thank all of you who have been contributing to Immaculate Conception Church, uh, parishioners who have been very, very loyally and dutifully uh, giving us your uh, support financially. Uh, you've been using electronic giving. Um, there's been an uptick in people who have been using that. Um, 
we appreciate that. Um, if you want to learn more about it, it's on my Facebook page this morning at around 7, uh, 6.30, I think, in the morning I posted it. Uh, so you can um, click on that um, on that icon and uh, link, and that will take you to how to give electronically. Uh, also, people are dropping it off in the mailboxes and the boxes upstairs of the ushers' boxes. Um, and I'm just moved by the support and the, um, the, the great devotion that you have to this parish that even in the midst of such a difficult thing, you know, you're remembering the importance of your church. And uh, some people really aren't financially affected by this too much. God bless them. And they're giving even more, actually, than they, than they, you, than they would, because I think they know, you know that we're really in need. Some are giving what they usually do, which is certainly, certainly um, very, very much appreciated and, uh, and very generous of them in, this, in these times, as I said. And then some can't give anything. One woman, like I said last week, came with me and said, oh, Father, I'm so upset. I can't give anything financially to the church right now because she was explaining a few things. I said, please. I said, that's the least thing you have to worry about right now. You know, just pray. She's a real prayer warrior, too. I said, just pray. Those prayers are more important than anything you could possibly give. So that's important, too. Um, but, you know, I'm very appreciative. The notes that I'm getting, people from other parts of the state of the country and, and even from another country, Canada, I got a beautiful donation and a beautiful letter from a woman from Vancouver who watches. So anyone who can do whatever they can uh, would be very, very much appreciated. We're really trying our best to bring to you, like almost like a, a Catholic network, <laughs> like EWTN, you know, bringing you all kinds of devotions and masses. And and uh, and I hope I know you're appreciative. I hope you are, and I know you are. And then you've been showing that by your financial support, which I very, very much appreciate. And uh, you know, Immaculate Conception has been around since 1886. We've had to undergo World War One and and the Great Depression and World War II and, um, and the Vietnam War and the unraveling of society in the 60s um, with the breakdown of the family and with all kinds of issues and problems that occurred after the Second Vatican Council with, with craziness that was going on in, in churches and everything. So we've, we've weathered all of these storms in this parish. And this is the biggest storm that we've had to weather. And as pastor, I recognize that, that I am pastor of a church right now that I don't think any other pastor has had to um, endure what we're enduring um, in the history of this parish. Uh, not even the Great Depression or not even, um, you know, the wars. So um, I realize the significance of that. And I hope everyone does. And that's why this parish has to survive because it survived all these other calamities and problems that have occurred in the over 130 years of its existence. And, you know, it's going to be different when we come back, you know, when it comes to parishes and parishes that can't afford to stay open, maybe won't, and they'll merge. Um, I don't want that to happen to come back to the exception. So that's why we really have to do everything we can to give as much as we can. And believe me, I really hope you know how very much appreciative I am for your contribution. Secondly, I want to mention that um, I'm praying the rosary every day, as you know, with you. And I decided that we'll pray the rosary. At the end of the rosary, we'll pray for the intentions of our bishop, Thomas Tobin, in Rhode Island. I really believe we have to focus and concentrate on praying for our bishops. If you're listening to me or watching this from another diocese, and you want to join me in the rosary, then when I say the name Thomas Tobin, insert your bishop as well, so you can pray for mine and yours. And it's so important because they're the ones, really, that have to make this decision as to when to come back, when to open the churches. It really isn't even the governor. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the governor can't dictate to the church. It's a separation of church and state. The bishop is complying because he knows the safety of people and the importance of, of you know, listening to the, you know, uh, the credible uh, voices that are out there suggesting and urging and demanding even what we need to do. 
But ultimately, this is the bishop's decision. I can't open up the church next Sunday and say, okay, we're going to separate six feet away from each other and we're going to wear masks and I'll figure out how many people can be in church at a particular time. I don't, I don't have the authority to do that. I can't open up the churches next week. Um, only the bishop can do that. Uh, we're, we, we're Catholics. We believe in the succession of the apostles and we're obedient to them. So, they, so that's why it's so important that we pray for them because this is the most important decision maybe that a bishop has ever had to make in the history of the church and it's fallen upon our bishops. So it's really that serious and that important and that's why we need to pray for our bishops. Um, you know, we can beg the governor to open up and all that, but I mean, where, where is that going to get us? Where it's going to get us is, uh, you know, maybe even more frustrated. It's the bishops that we have to pray for that have to make the decision of when we're going to open and what the requirements are going to be. So that really is important then that we pray for them, that we stay focused on our prayer. And that's really what I'm trying to do with this network, so to speak, that we've kind of created here in this chapel is a network of prayer, just constant prayer coming up to God. And that's what's going to get us through it. It really is. Um, lastly, I want to bless all mothers. I want um, to tell them how much we're appreciative of them, as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, uh, for their beautiful devotion to their families, to their loved ones, uh, to their friends. Uh, they're the backbone of the family, they're the matriarchs, they keep the family together, they are, are, the, are the staple and the, and the pillar of the family. And so our women are very, very precious to us and the work that they do, the domestic work around the house, cooking and cleaning, as well as having a job. These days, of course, you know, they, they're working full time, they come home and they cook and they clean and uh, they, they deserve they deserve the utmost um, respect and love and devotion from us. So from the bottom of my heart, all the women in my family, my mother and all the women in my family, I thank you and all the women in my parish who are moms. I thank you for your devotion and your love. And those who aren't moms and who are women in my parish, I bless your moms for bringing you in the world. And I know you're appreciative for them. So let's pray then. Uh, and I'll give a special blessing to all moms. So moms, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Almighty God, we ask a very special blessing upon all moms. We ask that you bless them, help them, give them strength and courage and perseverance. Today is Mother's Day, especially in the sadness of this day, many of them not being able to see their children. May they be consoled by your love and your truth in the world. And may they be helped and supported and especially kept healthy and safe and secure during this time of, of difficulty and crisis, especially our older moms. May they maintain their health and be protected. And may the blessings of Almighty God descend upon all moms who are watching this, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may the blessings of Almighty God descend upon you and remain with you forever, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Proceed.